This is the story of my 15-day journey sailing across the Atlantic Ocean with 10 strangers. We raced in the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers from Gran Canaria to St. Lucia and earned third place in our division. I had wanted to do this since the age of 15, but I was told I was too young and inexperienced. Then I found Incisor, a boat from the Isle of Wight, Great Britain. racing started, the captain's wife gave us a visual demonstration on how men should pee off the boat. It's actually a valid safety concern, as a good portion of men who go overboard are found with their flies unzipped. We left the dock with the understanding that there would be no turning back, and that we wouldn't see land for another two weeks until we reached St. Lucia. Pictured here is the coast of Gran Canaria. The square boulders are intended as a first line of flood defense, breaking waves before they reach the city. This was also the last glimpse of land I got before the race. The starting line was packed with boats from all over the world. Most of the boats were from the UK and Northern Europe. This is the aft hatch, and this goes straight down to the navigation table and the two aft bunks. Here is our main hatch, and we've also got up here a forward hatch, which leads down to the toilet, uh, or the head, as we like to call it. And we don't like to keep that open, because sometimes a wave will come in, and being rained on while sitting on the toilet is an unpleasant experience. Somebody tried to throw a dirty wet wipe out of the bathroom hatch and now it is on the lifelines and no one knows whose it is. Hygiene on the boat is difficult. All we have are wet wipes and basically hand sanitizer and we don't have enough water for all of us to shower every day. So every once in a while we get to use the, the fresh water for a bird bath. You may be thinking, oh, you could use the salt water from the sea, uh, but you can't because it'll give you a rash. You can't even wash your clothes in salt water. Salt water rash especially affects the hands. Actually, by the end of the trip, the skin on my fingers was so dried out by the salt that it started to peel off. Here is a tether. And this clips onto different parts of the boat, so if I fall in, I stay attached. Thankfully, I have not fallen in yet. My life jacket also has a strap for between the legs, which makes for some interesting wedgies. Here is my bunk. And here is a lee cloth, which keeps you from rolling out in the middle of the night. The top bunks don't have lee cloths, but they're tilted more towards the side, so it's less likely that you roll out. That being said, people do roll out of top bunks. I was lucky enough to sleep right next to the squeaking steering gear, so this is what I heard all night long. Back to the bed system, we each share our beds with someone else. You have to share your bed with someone for a different watch or shift, otherwise you'd be in it at the same time. Under each bunk we have uh, mostly food, but sometimes cleaning supplies. There can be no wasted space on a boat. And here are the steering cables that squeak incessantly. They've gotten a little bit better since we've lubricated them with the captain's suntan oil. It's better than it was on the first few days, but there's still some room for improvement. Here is our shoe cooler, and we're supposed to put our shoes in here because they smell so bad. And there are 11 of us living in a 45 foot space. Oops, I have to put my shoes in there. Well. Mine don't smell so bad. 
My crewmates may beg to differ. Needless to say, it smells really, really bad. Uh, you really want to stay upwind of everyone if you don't want to get a whiff of them. And uh, down below, there really is no escape. Here is the galley, which is basically a kitchen. Here is the stove here, or the cooker, as we like to call it. And it swings so that it stays upright when the boat heals. And it has special brackets to hold our pots in place. Here is the salt water pump, which we can use as much of as we like, because salt water is unlimited. And here is the fresh water pump. And we use this very judiciously because we can only make a certain amount of fresh water in a day. Here is our red light, which we turn on at night so it doesn't ruin your night vision. It's easier on the eyes than the white lights that are usually used during the day. Here are our tea mugs. We use these a lot. I'd say we make a cup for just about everyone on board every two hours or so uh, during the day or night because you know British we actually washed all our dishes with salt water because of the limited amount of fresh water on board so anytime you would make a cup of tea it would be just a little bit salty and here is our tea it's PG tips a classic black tea and we have it with a little bit of milk and no sugar. Here are our garbage cans and this is the one for all the stuff we have to bring back with us because it's not biodegradable. And here is our biodegradable garbage which should not include a Snickers wrapper. And we just huck all of this overboard when it starts to smell or when the bucket gets full. Other than biodegradable trash, we also had to throw overboard anything that was a medical or safety concern. So baby wipes we couldn't keep with us. And uh, yes, it's not good for the environment, but our health uh, is very important and disease can spread if we kept dirty wipes or any sort of tissue like that on the boat. And here is our bathroom. The sink is broken, so we use Purell instead. The toilet works by manual pump, so you have to pump the black handle about 20 times to flush it fully with seawater. Even by the last day, someone on board had not yet figured out how to flush the toilet. So here is a sail that we ripped this morning. Um, that I ripped with, uh, by sailing by the leaf when I was on the helm this morning. And uh, we're trying to salvage whatever we can off of it. So the rope with the line and uh, the sail is beyond repair. Uh, the head entirely came off, it just kind of torn too. There it is. <laughs> um, the head. That's, that's the head, it just tore off. Over the course of this trip, I learned to navigate by the stars, the way sailors did before technology. I used a traditional angle measurement device called a sextant, as pictured here. The purpose of the sextant is to measure the height of a celestial body. So in this case, I am finding the distance between the sun and the horizon. And I do this by taking a measurement with the sextant and then using some tables and calculations, uh, just some simple algebra. Navigation now relies on advanced electronics. Now this is our chart table and this has all of the electronic navigational equipment. We are not allowed to have any food or drink here because that could compromise the electronic equipment. Here is our radio. It is set to channel 16, which is the emergency channel. We can use the radio to contact other ships that we are nearby. 
And here is our satellite phone, which can communicate anywhere in the world, but we don't like to use it because it's very expensive. This is the ship's logbook, and it contains all the information that we would need to navigate manually if all the electronics shut down in an emergency. Here is our chart plotter, and right here is Gran Canaria, which is an island off the coast of Morocco, but it's owned by Spain. And if we were to sail directly to St. Lucia, this would be the course we would take. Uh, but we are sailing a little farther south to get some better wind. So we are right here, right now. And we think the strategy will get us there a lot faster than the other boats. The wildlife on this trip was truly amazing. Dolphins swam beside our boat at sunset. Now the flying fish are a completely different story. These uninvited guests flop their way onto the boat in the middle of the night. They have an extraordinarily pungent fish smell, and I even saw one of my crewmates get hit in the face by one. It's Friday, December 11th, and uh, we've had an interesting couple of days. Uh, yesterday, uh, in the night, we had some sail tears in our mainsail and actually to fix it we use the sail that I tore or that was torn earlier this week so kind of like everything happens for a reason uh, and then last night we had another tear uh, up here you can see it's pretty big but we're not too worried about it because we've got a lot of wind anyway so we're going just as fast and it's all right um, right now we're doing some water making every day we fill up our plastic bottles down here the water bottles by turning on the engine and running the water maker you can see it's just like dribbling in and we do this uh, so we have fresh water for drinking and for little bird baths and for washing our clothes. Uh, washing is a loose term. Um, you're, not, you're not using fresh water for washing our clothes? No. no well, I haven't been washing my clothes. Oh, you dirty girl. And uh, sometimes when the water takes a bath, we put in this stuff called squash. And it's kind of like juice, and it makes it taste better. Escaping the heat, it's hot down below, and it's really hot on deck. It's really sunny, and there's no air conditioning, no ice. No By about four days into the trip, no one was wearing clothes on deck anymore. The weather was getting warmer as we moved south and closer to the equator. Bikinis and underwear became the norm. So I actually didn't do any laundry for the entirety of the trip. I just threw my dirty underwear in the ocean because I didn't want to bring that home as a souvenir. So if anyone finds purple Fruit of the Loom underpants at the beach in the British Virgin Islands, they're mine and I don't want them back. By this point in the trip, we were all really settling into our life at sea. We had really come together as a crew and gotten used to our new routine. You can see some seaweed floating by us, and we've been seeing that for the past few days, and it's a signal that we're getting close to land. Right now, uh, we are about 300 something nautical miles from St. Lucia. Everything's going pretty smoothly. Finally doing 
something. It's, it's fine if anything else is out anyway. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon and she's awake. Life is good.